Tylea's Troubles, Part 97. Good General. Remus, the Palazzo Montini, official residence of the Arch Lecter of Moore. Winter, 2403-4. to four. General Jan Valkenberg had entered the audience chamber accompanied by only one companion, Captain Wallenstein of his cuirassier. Several of the Arch Lecter's palace guards were stationed about the room's periphery. At least two of them accompanied His Holiness at all times. But the only other person present was Arch Lecter Bernardo Ugolini himself. The absence of clerks, priests or advisers was deliberate, emphasising that the meeting was a private affair. His Holiness sat upon a heavy and large chair at the head of a long table. After greeting the two Marienburgers, he invited Valkenberg to take the only other chair. He made a fuss over ascertaining whether a third chair ought to be brought for the captain, but Wallenstein said he preferred to stand. It was late afternoon and sunlight poured almost horizontally through the windows to fashion a sedate shadow play from the halberdier guards, an effect enhanced by the room's stark and sparse decoration. Unlike most palazzos, with their fantastical frescoes and friezes, here the walls were plain, white-painted plaster. There were several hanging carpets of intricate designs placed at regular intervals, but as each was woven with the exact same geometric pattern, they only added to the ambience of calm, meditative reflection. All of this was deliberate. Upon election, the arch lector had ordered the Palazzo Montini's garish walls and ceilings painted over, and the removal of nearly every statue, golden candelabra, painting and rug. He wanted his palace both to reflect and magnify the thoughtful serenity he yearned to achieve. He had much thinking to do. I am very pleased that at last we meet, good general, began the arch lector. I know full well what you have achieved in the south, your army single-handedly defeating Kernag's several forces and so preventing their further cruel incursions. I also know the prejudice of so many Tyleans and the unwarranted suspicions they harbour concerning your presence. Yet, here you are now, in answer to both mine and Lord Alessio's calls, with no obvious reward beyond knowing you will serve with the living against our greatest enemy. And yes, I am aware that even upon your journey northwards you are subject to slanderous and entirely false accusations of plunder and murder. Yet even then... You were willing to put aside your righteous anger, forsaking the opportunity to attain entirely justifiable revenge and continue your march. Indeed, Your Holiness, said the General, some duties lie above all others, above our personal wants and desires. You, as a man of cloth, know this well. My duties here in Tylea rise above the slanders of petty burghers, and so we move past them. Referring to Duke Guidobaldo Gondi, princely ruler of one of the most important city-states in Tylea, as a petty burger, was an extraordinary slight, which the arch-lector must surely have noticed. Yet he gave no hint of displeasure. Perhaps he understood the extreme bitterness the general rightly felt as a consequence of Guidobaldo's actions, and so recognised the relatively impressive level of self-control required to limit the inevitable anger to such words alone. Although it may seem inappropriate for me to do so, said Bernardo, for I am not the party who wronged you, nevertheless I wish to offer Tylea's apology, being that of mine own, beloved flock, the followers of the tripartite gods and the vast majority of the citizens and subjects of Remus and other states. Duke Guidobaldo is but one man, howsoever many flaws he possesses, and I would not have you think badly of Tylea because of his unforgivable actions. The general nodded graciously. I harbour no such thoughts, Your Holiness. Many who dwell in this bountiful land have proved themselves most worthy, and my sincerest aim is to aid the nobles and Mother Church to restore peace and prosperity. Your help is much appreciated, good general, said the archlector. I fully accept there must be consequences for Duke Guidobaldo's actions. His actions will not be forgotten, nor forgiven, I do assure you. You have my word, General Valkenberg, that when this war is won, I will consult with you concerning what procedures should be initiated and what recompense ought to be demanded of the Duke. The General nodded, but it was the captain behind him who spoke. 
The army's officers will be glad to hear that promise, Your Holiness. Knowing that past wrongs are to be righted will help them concentrate upon that which must occupy them now. I should expect this promise will help all your soldiers in the battles to come, offered the Archlector. I would not want them suspicious of their Tylian allies, especially when the lives of both hang in the balance. General Valkenburg smiled. You can put that worry from your mind, Your Holiness. We have many a Tylian in our army, from the lowlier sapper to the Lady Lucia La Fancula, the bearer of our Myrmidian standard, so we know just how honourable and brave Tylians can be. As for the Pavone and Duke, I am satisfied with your suggestions. It can be suitably censured by the Church when the great troubles are resolved. Until then, it is a waste of all our efforts to pursue the matter. I would, however, hope your churchmen will use their influence to remind the more insular of their Pavonan flock that we are all allies against the terrible enemy. The Archlector gave a wry smile. I will instruct exactly that. But I would not get your hopes up concerning the sermonising of my Pavonan priests. They have certain schismatic tendencies, encouraged by the Duke himself. So, we are not the only ones to be troubled by the Duke's games, asked the captain. No, captain, said the Archlector. Few who have had dealings of any substance with Guidobaldo come away entirely unscathed. Yet... I know this can be of no consolation to you, nor, nor do I suggest it should, but I would at least have you know that his son, Lord Silvano, is cut from a very different cloth than that of his father. I believe him to be honourable to a fault. Indeed, such is his proper obedience, his lack of selfishness and guile, that I doubt he even sees his own father's faults. Lord Silvano has faced many enemies, remaining steadfastly true to his word, and even when defeated and driven from the field, returned willingly to fight again. His own men hid their treachery from him when the ogres were attacked at Viadaza. Presumably they knew he would order them to desist if he knew of their intentions. I have supped and marched with him, witnessed his bravery in battle, and I believe I know him well. Let not the sins of the father be visited upon the son. The general sighed. I do not doubt that Lord Silvano has demonstrated his bravery, he said, and his loyalty to his family is without question. Yet, Your Holiness, I advise caution, for he could be more dangerous than his father. Cunning and bravery combined make for a great prince, one all others should be most wary of. Cunning? asked the Archlector. What we see is what Lord Silvano wants us to see. How better to avoid all censure for a mutiny than to appear not only to have been ignorant of it, but also to have very convenient proof of one's absence while it occurred. And think how well it serves Duke Guidobaldo that Pavona can gain grateful friends to his princely heir, even while he himself commits heinous crimes. You think young Silvano's very character is a mere pretense? asked the Archlector, a note of incredulity evident in his voice. I cannot know for certain, Your Holiness, but his reputation has proven very convenient for his father. I spoke at length to Lord Silvano and found him too eloquent to be considered naive, and far too keen to present his father's numerous misdeeds in a good light to be entirely honest. His excuses and justifications were neatly crafted, like a lawyer's speech before a judge. The words of a skilled, even duplicitous diplomat, and not those of, as you suggest, a guileless youth. The Archlector nodded slowly. I shall keep all you have said in mind, good General, upon future occasions. Changing tack, he asked, What do you know of the tyrant Boldegut's whereabouts? Little that is certain, which troubles me. I have learned what is commonly said to be the case, but have no way of knowing if it is true. It was this consideration that led me to follow my elected route of march, farther east than I might otherwise have travelled, in the hope that I could intercept the ogres if they were attempting to skirt Lord Alessio's army. And although my army scouts are adequate to the task of supporting a marching column, I lack the numbers required to scour the entire eastern reaches of Tylea. The Archlector nodded. For brutes, they have proved to be a surprisingly nimble foe, and slippery to boot. However, my own advisers are unanimously of the opinion that Boldeguts has departed Tylea, making his way across the mountain passes to the border princes, whence he came. Reports from the vicinity of the Vianano have confirmed this. Yet, 
This does not mean he no longer presents a threat. We must not be careless, for he could return to seek plunder where he found so much before, a prospect that can only grow more likely as time passes and his haul of loot diminishes. At present we must contend with new robbers. No doubt you have heard how the Sartosans have brutally raped Lucini. It is almost certain they have their eyes set upon more prizes, especially as every city-state is either sapped of strength by the ongoing wars or unprotected because their armies have marched north. I heard that their commander, Volker, is a Marienberger. Is this true? Of course I've heard of Volker, answered the general, and it does seem likely he hails from Marienberg. The VMC is a merchant company, and as such we make a point of learning what we can about all pirates, especially if they might prove detrimental to our enterprises. As is so often the case, he was probably a mere sea artist or ship's mate, rather than a captain or merchant, who mutinously turned to piracy. Not the sort of man I would know personally. By your leave, General, asked the captain. Speak your mind, said Valkenberg, so quickly that it was plain he trusted the man to contribute something of worth. The captain turned to the archlector. I do not doubt, your holiness, that uh, Sartosans could be more than a mere thorn in our side, and that while Boldegutz lives, he too remains a threat. But surely the vampire Duchess presents the most immediate and greatest danger. No one would happily turn their back on the Sartosans. But do we have a choice? I do not believe so, said the archlector. One suitably powerful blow should scatter the pirates for years to come, as it has done in the past. Much more will be needed to rid Tylere of the undead, however. Despite defeating them several times, their evil only grows. For them, our several victories have proved to be nothing more than minor setbacks. They never want for soldiers, and they know no fear. For they are blasphemy made flesh by foul conjurations. There was a moment's silence as the archlector became lost in thought, a frown fixed upon his face, his eyes glazing as if he no longer saw the others in the room. Your Holiness, said the General, my army can help to contain them, in the field or in their fastnesses, but only the church or colleges have the power to provide any lasting answer. Weight of numbers is sufficient merely to check their further advances, not only for a time. If we are to destroy them completely, then we have need of holy intervention or arcane magics, perhaps both, or a host of heroes like those of myth and legend. I am afraid we lack the latter, despite a substantial cast of great villains. Even an army of cultists, mortally dedicated in body and soul to more, failed against the vampires. I not only pray for guidance daily, but have consulted the wisest maestros and wizards Remus has to offer. Only yesterday I met with Angelo D'Aleoni, who spoke concerning the manifestation and magnification of purifying flames to burn the vampires' armies, their leaders amongst them, obliterating even the wicked spirits possessing their bodily frames. Yet he finally admitted his want of not only the necessary ingredients for such, but the very receipt. And he expressed great doubts concerning whether anyone could survive an attempt to bring such flames to bear. An answer is needed, Your Holiness, otherwise all our sacrifices may prove to be in vain, and this is not all we must contend with. Lord Alessio has sent word to me twice of ratmen sightings, not just spies, but armies, although apparently not massive in size. The archlector nodded gravely. It is true, he said. I have received the same intelligence from Captain Soldatovia, commanding the Remans who march with the Porta Majorans. He himself saw one of their tunnel mouths, and his own scout saw one of their armies. Small, as you say, perhaps little more than a raiding party, or the ragged remnant of some faction fleeing a far-off civil war. You have reason to think so? asked the General. No, good General, only wishful thinking. If instead they are the vanguard for something bigger, then their arrival could be the last straw for Tylea. They are a vile threat, spat Falkenberg, his particular hatred for them being obvious. Much worse than orcs, perhaps more so than ogres and undead. They lurk insidiously, relentlessly, and must be purged entirely and in all instances. 
Perhaps the archlector was reminded of a certain predecessor's infamous pact with the Uomi Nirato. If so, he hid it well, simply saying, I have tasked several scholars with looking into how we beat them in ages past. The captain almost laughed. I wonder, he asked. Back then, were those Tylians fighting ogres, vampires and sartosans, as well as the ratmen?